What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another rocking episode of GLE. Before we get rolling, got an amazing guest today, but just we got to share. Remember these episodes, you know, they're only free if you don't get value. And if you get value, you're obligated to share them out and pay that fee and make sure you share them with somebody else so they can get value too. Give it a rating, subscribe, follow, so you can get updates on the latest episodes and just make sure you're sharing it out because you're getting value out of it and make sure others get value out of it too. So let's go ahead and get rolling into today. Got an awesome guest. He's a motivational speaker. He shifts people to the right mindset so they can double down, which I want to hear more about and overcome the inevitable failures that serve as stepping stones in life. You can find him at be the change USA on Facebook and YouTube, be the change underscore USA on Instagram and double down strategy.com. Anthony, Michael Russo, welcome to GLE. What's cracking? How you doing, brother? I'm doing great, man. So tell our guests a little bit about you, man. You got a really, really cool background in uh, public speaking, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, how did that lead you down this road to where you are today with your purpose and your mission? Absolutely. So I, uh, I started speaking about well, funny enough, I went to art school. So I was a graphic design major, communications uh, design major and uh, advertising. And right out of school, everybody quickly realized that it was not my design skills that I was good at. It was my speaking uh, ability because I somehow could articulate myself into a good grade. Uh, even if the work was kind of garbage. So I went into sales naturally right out of college. Okay. And uh, in, and I was still stuck in the graphic design industry, like sales in that area. And then somewhere, got somewhere around the middle of it, everything happens by chance. And also there's a path. And if you follow it, you follow it. So I started losing weight to run marathons. And next thing I know, I started getting into promotional work, which is like where you go and you, you know, you're a Budweiser boy and different stuff like that. Like you go to bars and you give, you give, drinks to people, whatever. Got a job on the road then with uh, Coca-Cola Spirit of Champions, which was an NCAA sponsored tour. And we like did the setup, we did the breakdown. And next thing you know, I became our lead MC. I'd never been on microphone a day in my life. Wow. And next thing you know, I went from being the new guy to the lead MC in about four months to then being the guy that the NCAA like two years later said, you know, hey, would you like to come on field in, you know, the halftime and do a promotion for us on field? And then over a couple of years after that, I then was doing every single national championship for the NCAA, as well as uh, spots for different uh, advertisers on field and in front of tens of thousands of people. Wow. Uh, and then I then I just went, I guess, became a professional speaker at that point. So that's super cool. That. So <laughs> did you get nervous when you were talking in front of those big crowds or how, how do you feel when you when you do that? What's, I mean, the first time I was kind of like, I, it's kind of, it's funny to me, I get really jacked up and uh, I'm a person that I know that in that moment, you know, the, the, the flight or fight type thing or fight or flight, I'm more of a fight instead of flight person. So that energy made me want to do it more. And it was almost like a caffeine energy boost. Now, with that said, I am more comfortable in front of 75,000 people than I am in front of a room of 10, especially if I know the people. My heart starts to beat out of its chest. So I, I, you and I were talking a little bit earlier. So when I started getting into motivational speaking, it was the complete opposite. Wow. So I went from 75,000 or 20,000 regularly to then these small rooms or even like, I don't know if you've ever done stand up, uh, but stand up at a small, <laughs> oh small areas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, dude, that's awesome. Man. And but there, I get so nervous and I, I know that I can do it because I can, I've done spring break events for, for years and I'm in front of 10,000 college students and I can talk smack for three hours <laughs> straight and just talk, 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 talk and have a big crowd and bounce back and forth. But when it is a small room of 10 people, whether I'm doing motivational speaking or an open mic night, it's like I have 170 beats per minute and I'm freaking out for some That's odd reason. Crazy, it's much harder. Man. So yeah. is it, um, is it different for you? Like in those situations with bigger crowds, like, are you like, is your face out there or are you sitting like behind a desk just with a microphone? No, I'm the jumbotron guy. So I'm not the uh, PA okay. guy. So my face is on the, the jumbotron. Cool. So my, I'm out there. But with that said, it's very impersonal. 
where it's not is not as intimate as yeah. uh, it's not as intimate as you know a small group of people. Like being this close to somebody is just for some odd reason to me it's different. I can still do it, but it's a it's a different thrill, I guess you could say. Yeah, I've I've always been amazed by stand up comedy. I truly think that stand up comedy is like the truest form of public speaking. Like if you oh, can yeah. get up in front of a crowd and these guys that do like an hour, two hours. Like if you can get up just you on a stage with a mic for two hours and just generate and and make that room spin, like that is incredible to me. That yeah. like, it's just amazing. Have you ever amazing. heard of a, a comedian by the name of Ian Bag? Ian Bag. He he was on one of those TV shows, like the competition TV shows. I don't if, think I have. Actually. If not, look up Ian Bag. So he does a, he does a great set. But what makes Ian Bag special, especially he's got you know place in my heart, is he yeah. does crowd work, and he oh. can literally he'll talk to you, and then he'll talk to the girl like eight rows down, and then he'll talk to the person in back, and he'll piece everybody's story together just perfectly to make fun of everyone in the room, wow. and that's to me, like utter and complete brilliance. Like you That's can always crazy. do a Robin Williams set. Like Robin, yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, if you're great, you could do it. But the ability to use these anecdotes that he probably uses all the time, but finding a formula to make it work with the crowd to me is absolutely ph phenomenal. Yeah, super cool. That That is, I'm, I'm a huge student of just the whole idea of, um, you know, I think a lot of times in life, we don't set up the premise when we're talking. And like when you're telling jokes, it's so blatantly obvious like hey that joke didn't land right because you didn't people didn't get what you were talking about right. and i think so often when we have miscommunications in life it's because we like the other person doesn't know what we're even talking about because we didn't right. set it up in a way that they can understand it right so i've always just been intrigued by just concepts from stand-up so it's so cool that, that you're a big fan too tell us more about doubling down what does doubling down mean? <laughs> so doubling down, it's funny. I uh, When I started getting into wanting to shift to more motivational speaking, because I made that decision like seven, eight years ago, because I had a successful promotional staffing firm. And I'm like, I know that this is going to end at one point. And funny enough, thank God, I no longer had it coming into COVID because there was no events. <laughs> um, but I, I knew that there was something more for me to use my voice and speak and try to motivate people. I didn't know what my topic was. And I created my company, Be The Change in 2016. But what is that? Like, how do I create a whole speak speech on being the change, which now I know because it's evolved. But at the time, I was like, what is, what's true to me? What's personal? So I had a speaking coach and I always encourage people as they're going through life decisions to actually spend money on people that can help or programs that can help that are actually helping you get to that next step. And people are like, I don't want to spend any money. It's like, eh. there is something to it. Even if you don't have money, you have to kind of find a way. Like that's what Tony Robbins sells. He's like, you know what? You don't have $400, find a way to borrow it. So anyways, I got into, I got into my speaking coach and we started talking and I'm like, what do I do? Do I write a book? And what's my topic? I've got no idea. So funny enough, uh, I ended up doing something that was very unlike my character, but it was like my father. So my father is a, um, was, was a compulsive gambler when he was still alive. He had multiple sclerosis wow. and he played a style of blackjack when we were, I grew up very, very poor. So it wasn't like he was the guy doing like $200,000 at the table. He was essentially gambling away the life savings, you know, yeah. when he went out. No, no good. No good. But he played with a style called uh, a negative progression, which is a non-sexy title <laughs> for doubling down. So I call I shifted it to double down strategy in my mind. And there's a reason why it played in my world. But first sure. for him, negative progression is have you ever heard of negative progression before? I haven't. Enlighten me. So I it actually can sometimes work depends, but it, it negative progression is when you double your bet every time you lose. So if you start with ten dollars, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you start with ten, you lose, you bet twenty. If you lose, you bet forty. Now mathematically, it sounds like you just break even, but you don't. You always end up one bet ahead of where you started, no matter what. When you win, you could lose ten hands in a row, but you're up yeah. to like you know fifteen hundred. As, as long as you still got money to put in. As long as you still, as long as you're still willing to reach in your, in your pocket. Now the casino yeah. loves people that plays by this because even though it's almost fail, foolproof, most people that are willing to just win $10 per win are not going to be willing to put $2,000 on the table, which is kind of a life lesson. If you're willing to chip away at stuff, you have to be willing to keep reaching in the pocket of, of life is what I say. Right, but right. 
And also there's, there's no table maximums in life. There yeah. is at the casino. Sure, so, sure. so the doubling down strategy is just that because it looks at what, what almost, well, almost destroyed my dad and, and our family and all that different stuff. And then why did it pertain to me? I didn't put two and two together. I, uh, I, I sold my staffing firm or I merged it and I was like, what do I do next? I'm working with Be The Change. I'm trying to figure out how to build it. I didn't have the income that I used to have. And I got into day trading, stock trading uh, mm. options. I did really well at first. So, you know, I took, I took 40,000, turned it into 60,000. I'm like, oh, I'm good at this. And then I got a little fast and loose and I started gambling. And I realized I've never had a gambling issue. If I wanted to go to Vegas and just have a little fun, lose $300, it was nothing like what, what was my dad's issue. And I also had money from all the work that I'd done. Yeah. But what I started to do was... In my head, I'm like, every time I'm I'm screwing up, I'm learning a lesson that I never made the same mistake twice. So I kept doubling down. I'm like, this is working. I'm not making the same mistake twice, but I still kept losing. And the the day and the moment that I realized that I had become a version of my father in a different way and in 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 almost a compulsive state of mind was I did a marijuana stock. It was Tilray. It was, uh, if, if anybody's into stocks, they'll probably remember this was like a day that Tilray went parabolic and I made a decent amount of money overnight on an option, on a stock option, which are incredibly volatile if you don't know options. So it's incredibly volatile. I did okay. And then I got greedy and I wanted to play again. And I was on a lunch break at a gig that I was doing for an auto manufacturer that I was working for. And on a lunch break, the stock shot straight up. I got in, I got in too late and the, uh, they shut down trading on the stock because of some issues. Wow. Long story short, in a matter of 30 minutes, I lost 70, anywhere from 73 to $7,700. I can't remember in about two seconds, just like that. I didn't have that money to spend at the time. I didn't have the income and it literally triggered something in my brain. And that night I became Jerry Maguire. I did the whole like middle of the night writing my thing. And I'm like, (laughs) could I make money trading stocks? Yes. I'm, I was trading at any given point, $70,000 from my mobile phone. Just be glad cryptos weren't around back then, man. Oh, oh, it would have been, well, <laughs> may, if they were, crap, might be may, good, I, who yeah. knows, who knows? <laughs> might be good. So, we might not be talking though. So that yeah, be. true, true, true. Doge to the moon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, uh, that night I looked at, I kind of looked back and I'm like, what do I do in my life? I've talked about, I wanted to, to speak to people and change people's lives and, and get into this. Or do I go into day trading where I have the whole setup? I have, you know, five computers, whatever I want. And I actually commit myself to it. And I realized that's not what I wanted to do with my life. So in that case, I folded. But I realized the lessons I was learning were exactly how I want to portray how I, how I teach people and help people to overcome failure, to continue to double down, to never give up. And that is where double down strategy was essentially born. And within five days, I had a speaking coach. Uh, not for speaking, but for kind of marketing myself and getting into it and, and all these different things happening. And finally now, what, two and a half, three years later, I should have a, a book in a few months. Very cool. I love the idea of doubling down on your failures. That's, that's a concept that many, well, only the successful really embrace in reality, which is why they're successful. Right. And, and yeah. so many just shy away from failures, but I just think that's a great, it's a great metaphor. I never would have thought of that that way. You know, and yeah. I don't think m- most people would have thought of it like that. Um, I was going through your Instagram, looking at some of the quotes that you post. Yeah. And um, one of the things that you posted was um, God's plan for you is about his plan for the world around you. And I thought that was really a cool quote. I'm curious how faith plays a role in, in your life and in, and in be the change and how this whole thing started. Yeah. So 20, 2021 is also interesting as we're kind of evolving. I've, I was raised, uh, I was raised Christian. Um, definitely went to church like three days a week when I was younger and then never strayed from God, but just kind of got over, um, got over going to church. Uh, I was, I lived in Milwaukee for a long time and it was very Catholic and that just wasn't my speed, but I always had a good relationship with God. And part of that is obviously faith. So faith that things go the right way. And I, I'll, I'll give an interesting story here. So one lesson that I've really read and learned is, uh, successful people, understand that everything happens for a reason. And it sounds cheesy. It's just like, yeah, everything happens for a reason, but no things, things do. And failures are bound to happen. 
it's if we look at failure as a woe is me situation, or maybe God had a plan and maybe there was a reason behind it. And I, I, I it took me until fifth or sixth time I actually spoke to realize that this is a really impactful story and I should tell it to people and share it. So the reason why I relate my, doubling down to my personal businesses is I had two major failures. My first two businesses failed. My third business went straight to being a million dollar a year revenue business with no capital. So I, but I used all these lessons from these first two businesses. And in this first business, when I say that faith plays a major role, especially looking back, is I, uh, it was a dog tag company. It was called like, you know, jewelry dog tags. It was called Pride Tags. It's part of being something more. I had collegiate licensing. Everything that could have gone right went right. I got a $100,000 business loan. I had a great business plan and the economy went kaput. And I had one item and nobody wanted to, none of the stores wanted to buy it. And uh, th- well, few, but they wanted st- uh, multiple items, but there, mm-hmm. it was a failure. One of the connections I had in Milwaukee was with Harley Davidson. And I was like, all right, at least it's the 150th anniversary. I'm going to print out some of these dog tags. I talked to the people I knew there. I knew that I, I, I'm like, I won't have any issues getting licensing. They said I should be good. So I used whatever remaining money that I had in my business loan And I printed like $7,000 or $6,000 worth of these dog tags. I'm like, I'm going, I'm going to go, I'm going to make 20 grand. I'm going to have a little boost. I got this. And about two and a half weeks before I find out that I couldn't get licensing, somebody signed an exclusive deal on dog tags with Harley and I was kind of screwed. So I had to go to Milwaukee and literally be a, like hawk them on the street. Fortunately, I had great friends there that were like helping me here and there. Some bars let me set up and I'm, I was that guy sitting there going like, Hey, two for $15. And it was honestly one of the lowest moments of my life. Not because that's not fun, but when it's your own business, it's very difficult on the psyche. And I, I was the only, one of the only times in my life I had a, a nervous breakdown. So this is where faith comes into play. So my mom, uh, who had lost her business, she was a chiropractor. She came to Milwaukee to help me out. And she, she was, I guess around 50 at the time. And, uh, she had been going through a knee injury, losing her business, uh, everything going wrong in her life, but she wanted to help her son. We were a very close mother son relationship. And we got, she got to Milwaukee, helped me out a ton. I broke even, I think it could have been way better. It could have been way worse. Um, but here's, here's the interesting part. So what she was going through in her own life, I knew that she had battled with depression and different things like that, but I didn't know how serious it was. So because of this failure in my life, it turns out that she was at a point where she was giving up. She was ready to, she was ready to cash in the chips for <laughs> based on what we were talking about earlier, but she was, uh, she was at a point where she was ready to give up. And if I was successful in that moment of my life, she had the letter written. She was ready to commit suicide when she got home. Wow. And the thing that saved her was seeing the fact that I still needed her in my life. So that to me is a a really poignant anecdote to tell people that think that whatever failure in front of them is the end of the world, when in all reality, that could be God saving something else. So I could have had a very successful business. I had college licensing. I had all these great things and I could have been living the dream. My mom could have been miserable and committed suicide. And I have this company and and without my closest friend. Wow. So that's where faith is. Powerful story. Yeah. I, you know, I got a, if you, I follow a guy named Ed Milet. You ever hear of Ed? Yeah. He's a good dude. He, uh, he always says things happen for us, not to us. Mm-hmm. And I love the Bible verse, you know, God works everything for the good of those who love and trust in him. And I totally agree, man. I think so many times, and it, it's always funny. Like, I feel like God kind of pushes us to like this point, kind of like, you know, she had the letter written, right? Yeah. Like she, she was like, right about to give up. Right. And then something happens. And I, I've just found, you know, many times in my life that happens where it's like, you know, I'm, I'm stressed over something to the point of like, man, why is this the way? It was kind of like I was having my, I call it my midwife crisis. I really wanted yeah. to find a wife in my twenties and I was waiting <laughs> for the right girl to come along. I didn't want to marry someone I worked with. Right. Like that wasn't what I was looking for. And I ended up finding a wife uh, that I worked with and you know, you can't help where you meet them, but it's just so interesting how they push you right to the edge and then, you know, right before your faith can't handle it, God, God gives it to you. Right. It's yeah. It's just amazing. 
So you, it's funny. I got to bring it up now that you said kind of the, the wife thing. So 20, <laughs> like for me, um, I'm, I'm 30, 38 years old now, and I've been single my whole life, uh, on and off relationship, six months here and there. And I use the excuse cause my father was handicapped. I I'm not, I don't have issues with commitment, but I do have issues with settling. That's just personally who I've always been. I, I feel as though don't I see so settle. don't settle. I see so many, so many of my friends that are just miserable and they're like, I knew at six months, it wasn't going to work. But anyway, so I, 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 I digress. So I, uh, I decided to buy an RV in 2020. I'm like, I like, I almost went through this like early midlife crisis. I got a dog for the first time. I saw it on Facebook. This dog led me to go, I want to explore. I don't have any of the jobs that I had before. You know, the event world is completely shut down. The world's kind of going crazy. I want to get an RV and a dog and all these, like, I want to go do something completely ridiculous. I get this 40 foot RV. I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with this RV? <laughs> so, I mean, I know how to drive a big truck. So next thing I know, I'm now like things kind of fell together and I'm now living on my buddy's land in Rome, Texas, which is in the middle of nowhere. And the one thought process I have in my head is like, well, it's going to be me, the dog, and I'm going to be pretty single for a while. And I'm okay with that, but uh, you know, and funny enough, uh, there's a, a girl that's uh, like once in a while would comment on my political stuff, but I, I met her 10 years ago. Like it was out of sight, out of mind. And like, I actually was interested in her friend 10 years ago. It wasn't even her. Uh, but her and I just started talking on Facebook uh, one day and we were dating within three or four days. And turns out she had an, uh, she had just bought a spa, which honestly is also not a great circumstance. Like some of the paperwork seemed to be kind of crappy and not, not all the way through. Like she probably would, if she could do it over, she wouldn't have the spa. I probably wouldn't do the RV, but we would not have met each other without it. And we've been dating now for just about six months. And there is no doubt, I think in either of our minds that this was the one that we were waiting for. And it came out of this circumstance that there is really no reason that on the outside, we would have seen this happening. So it's like, it's interesting. Hap- everything cool. happens for reasons. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's a super cool story. You know, y- yeah. y- you never know how you're going to meet them and you never know the ways that God's going to work in your life. Are you, you know, it's always when you don't expect it. I find, right. you know, it's always when you don't expect it. I was going back to some of these quotes I was pulling from your Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Cause I really liked quite a few of them. So w- one you. was, <laughs> if you want to make enemies, try and change something. And I thought that was cool. Progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Another yep. good mindset one. You talk a lot about change and dealing with change and obviously be the change. Yeah. So when it comes to making changes in your mindset, what, you know, where do we start? How do, how do we begin changing our mindset so we can go be the change? Yeah. So the cool part about the, like just the phrasing of be the change is obviously there's a political kind of concept to it. And there's also an interpersonal concept between you and others, between you and yourself. And ultimately um, the way that I would say to kind of um, moisten the soil per se, to get it ready for us to be able to change is to ultimately realize there is no perfect. There will, we'll never reach perfection. And that is not the point. The point is to grow at a rate that, is uh, brisk, but comfortable, and to actually be good to the people around us. And that'll allow us to actually grow as human beings. So there's a million different ways you can look at uh, at change, but ultimately to prepare yourself for failure. And it kind of goes, it does kind of double back to the, the philosophy on overcoming failure, doubling down for your successes and for your happinesses and all these different things and essentially being flexible. So it's, it's, if you want to relate it to the soil concept, it's just being uh, open to new things in your life, being open to different experiences, open to different kinds of people, and also open to the fact that you are going to fail. Mm-hmm. And things are not always going to work, whether it's relationships or whether it's going to be with work or new businesses. Uh, and I and getting over that concept that gets us willing to try things. The idea of taking risk has always been something so terrifying to us as people because I think we were raised. How, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I'm 32. Okay, so you're young. You're about I'm five just years a baby, younger, man. Just a yeah, baby. you are. You're a youngster. Uh, just came did out you the watch, womb not too long ago. <laughs> did you watch? Uh, uh, was it Varsity Blues? I think. Do you ever see Varsity Blues? Oh, I've seen it. It's been a while. Okay. Been so, a like while. the whole like 
that generation, which is my generation, and like right yeah. to you. So like people used like, to say I look like James Vanderbeek back when I was oh, that's shaven. Hilarious. Like, so did I. Here, I was, I I was a lot to, skinnier back then too. I used to get it too. It was from yep. Yeah, you do yeah. look a little. You do look a little yeah. like him. I can see it. <laughs> we have we have similar Just eyes. Grow your hair out, dye it blonde, <laughs> part it down the middle. You know, <laughs> twins, man. Exactly. That's funny. You got. I have a picture <laughs> with him and I at the uh, Country Music Awards a couple years oh, no ago. Kidding. Oh, and I'm like, do you mind? Because we had, we knew mutual people. And I'm like, do you mind if we take a picture? People say we look alike, and he looked at me, and he's like, Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> it was pretty yeah, there funny. You go. Um, but the uh, the whole philosophy from Varsity Blues was be perfect. And we were. Yeah. I think there's this 10 to 15 year area that everybody was being raised to be perfect. So we have such a fear of doing anything because we know that that's an unattainable goal. So in order to change things in our life, we have to have willingness to fail and a willingness to try and a willingness to take risks. And the pain that the pain that we get from, from failure and these risks and the things not working out still aren't as bad as a long-term effect of not actually trying to be excellent, to be extraordinary. You can still be extraordinary without being perfect. You know, one of my favorite lessons from varsity blues that I learned is puke and rally. Yeah. Uh, that's the one I remember. <laughs> yeah. I remember that, what that was McKean. the big takeaway back in the day for, <laughs> for us. But, um, luckily I grew out of that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> seeking perfection, man. Like, you know, we, we all strive for perfection, but like starting this podcast and s- stepping out there and, and doing some of these things where you're really following your dream and your passion and, you, and you're putting your heart out there and you're, you're putting your soul out on the line to face criticism. Right. And you talk about turning the other cheek, another biblical sort of philosophy. And um, I think we have to really be willing to be bad at something, right? If, if we're yeah. going to be great, like nobody came out the womb, swinging a ba- I'm a baseball guy. So swinging a baseball bat and hitting home runs, right? They, they're yeah. hours and countless hours of practice, right? If I work at something four hours a day, seven days a week, it's going to take me seven years to get to the 10,000 hour rule. Right. So I, we're always striving for like that quick fix, get rich quick, whatever, but these things take time and consistency. And at first you might suck, mm-hmm. right? Am I yeah. right? Yeah. 100%. Are you, what do you do? when you're dealing with that self-doubt, you know, you, it's harder than you thought it was going to be when you get into it. Like what's going on in your mind and and how do you keep going when you're feeling that? Well, first off, uh, like I I'm, I'm a big David Goggins fan. You embrace the suck because you know that it's making you stronger one way or the other. Um, and it's, um, I'll bounce back to your, your baseball. Uh, I always use a baseball analogy the the what is considered the ultimate in perfection in baseball perfect game somebody pitches 27 batters up 27 batters down the question then becomes has there ever been two perfect games in a row no perfection is fleeting incredibly short so if perfection is that short then the struggle is obviously going to be longer in many cases and i I, this is actually funny. I, I literally had this on my motivational Monday that I uh, taped this last week is if things suck, you have to reorganize what you have in front of you, make it manageable, make the crappy stuff manageable. So knowing that perfection is the seemingly, seemingly unattainable goal. So you have to make steps. You want to, you want to try to find a way to, to make tomorrow suck less. It's funny. That was our slogan at uh, uh, college world series <laughs> to, to you guys did great today. Uh, kind of a tomorrow. <laughs> let's suck a little less. So take, I'm a, I'm a notebook person. I have daily, I have things that I try to cross off. Probably yeah. didn't see it in that light. And if it's little things, the brain, and this is as psychological as I typically get, um, the brain needs to know that it's doing something good. Even when things are bad, it needs to know that you're accomplishing something. So it triggers the serotonin in the brain to say, all right, you're progressing, you're moving forward, you're getting out of it. So make a list of of to-dos that you have to do. And some of those might also be mental things, like take 10 minutes to meditate, take 10 minutes to the gratitude. I'm a huge believer in, in making gratitude lists. My girlfriend and I do that to each other all the time. And it's just uh, a full, and we t- it's not just about each other, but about the things going on in our life. So to focus on what is, uh, what is positive, focus mm-hmm. on what's positive and, and also make the daunting aspects of your life 
manageable. There was a great exercise somebody gave me one time. It was actually in a group setting and I've used it myself, pawned it off. Uh, I, I get everybody in the room to uh, find something that is red. Find something red around you. You see it, it's red. What You got it in your head, now close your eyes. Mm-hmm. After about five seconds, I say, okay, keep your eyes closed. Tell me something in your room that's yellow. They, most of the time, they can't do it because all they're thinking about what's red. And you think about this from a positive aspect. So if you yeah. all you're focusing on is the crappy things that are going on in your life, that's all you're going to see in your mind. Whereas if you start looking at the one or two positives, all mm-hmm. of a sudden your mindset shifts, everything changes, and you actually have the ability to be the change in your own body. And you have to take care of yourself in order to do that. That's really interesting. I've, one of my mentors, he goes way against the, the mainstream thinking on this mm-hmm. and bear with me here. And, and I hope the audience does too. <laughs> so he talks a lot about therapy and therapists and how kind of what you just described, focusing on negatives, you know, you go to therapy, you think about talking about all the stuff you got going on. And, and he's really an advocate for, hey, that stuff that already happened, it's in the past. It's already gone. If you continually speak it and repeat it and dwell on it, you'll keep reliving it. And he, so he's, he's a huge advocate for it. You know, speak what you want. And if you have something crap in your life, it's gone. It's already passed. Today's a new day. Just speak what you want and move forward and stop dwelling on it. And I thought that was a really interesting, you know, that's not a philosophy I'd really heard before he had shared it with me. I thought it was an interesting perspective. Have you ever heard anybody talk like that? Yeah, me. Yeah. (laughs) No, I, so that now if if, if, with permission, can I get a little bit political? Sure. Go for it. So, so what's interesting is we've been talking a lot about this recently, especially as the CRT or critical race theory has come up. And, and, and knowing a lot of the motivational speakers and uh, uh, life coaches that I know typically politically lean a little further pro like ultra social justice and ultra left and pro critical race theory and all these things. I'm kind of like, to me, I don't understand how that relates because ultimately learning history is one thing but basking in it is another. And that's, it's kind of how it goes into this. So it's like, to me, why would it be a positive thing to show a bunch of multiracial white or black Asian, whatever students teach them how oppressed and how impossible it was for minority races to, to get ahead and almost essentially pinning them as a victim starting at a very young age, because if Mm -hmm. you're pinned in, you're now, you're taking the past, the past trauma of American history, and now you're making them relive it and also giving them a reason to feel like failure is okay. And I don't understand how motivational speakers can think that this is okay. We always, we're constantly talking about getting out of a victim mindset and not falling back on it. So knowing where you came from and then giving yourself a plan on where to go is completely against everything that is in our school systems right now that they're trying to push from a more left perspective. And I just, as somebody that wants to breed positivity, it's like that happened. Let's not let it happen again. This is what we're going to do for the future. And it just, and that's exactly kind of what you just talked about from a motivational perspective. Like, cool. You have all these issues. Let's, let's talk about the positives and how we're going to get past it. Yeah. Let's talk about what we're going to do moving forward. So none of that happens again. Right. Yeah. Like let's somebody, stop dwelling on the past. Yeah. If somebody kept beating into my head about, you know, how bad my childhood was, it's probably, you know, like, and I didn't have a bad childhood. I mean, whatever. Sure. If somebody kept saying like, your dad was a compulsive gambler. You're not going to be anything because look at that. I'm probably going to have a much harder time getting past that. Right. Right. <laughs> Who's the guy? Um, I think it's the guy from Bruce. He's the, he, Obviously, I, I know the guy. I'm, his name's escaping me. He he played uh, God in Bruce Almighty. He, Steve uh, Steve Carell. No, he was God. He was the oh God the Morgan movie. Freeman. Morgan, Morgan Freeman. Freeman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard. Yeah, I heard Morgan Freeman. Uh, they were asking him something about Black History Month a long time ago. I don't know if you've yeah. seen this interview. Of course. <laughs> but he, he, you know, he basically said, "I don't want a Black History Month. I wish we'd stop talking about it." Yeah. He's like, "How is Black History different than any any other history?" 
Yeah. He's like, American. black history is American history. Like, yeah. we should just teach history. And, you know, I, I thought that was a really interesting perspective from him. And, it, you know, nowadays, it's the stuff they're teaching in schools, man. Like, people are going to have a hard time, you know, being able to put their kids into that propaganda machine public school system if it continues down this path. I don't. I honestly don't know. We're kind of getting to the point where I don't know how people can even justify letting their kids go through that. You know, it's really unbelievable what's being taught in schools at this point. So I had an eye-opening experience this last week. So we've got an event coming up this weekend, and I have uh, we have two gold star uh, wives that are on that are going to be a part of this event. And for those listening that don't know what a gold star wife is, it means that their husband li- died in the line of duty, and their children. And again, I don't, I, I honestly, I've have great friends on both sides. So it's not even about left or right, but it, it's, it's fascinating to me that their children are going through the public school system, both of these moms and their children, 12 and 14 on one of them. And then teenage years to in their twenties on the other lean politically left and not pro military, like not necessarily pro military. And they lost their fathers to, I, to me. I'm like, the school system has to be doing something very drastic f- to the point where these kids don't don't lean on the side of the more pro militaristic side of the political spectrum. I thought that was shocking. Yeah. I mean, if you want to change, if you want to change, you know, you think about a couple of years ago, well, I guess a couple of generations ago, you know, you got the first generation with no God in schools. And then you got the first generation of kids of the parents that didn't have God in schools. And, and now right. you've got our generation today with, you know, it's, it's just a progression, right. And, and you get them while they're young and um, that's, you know, you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you get them while they're young you can put all sorts of things in their minds. Right. They call it TV programming for a reason. Yeah. Um, one of the things you talk about is having divisive conversations. Your, your quote was sometimes to end division, you have to have divisive conversations. And I think we're, you know, we're, we're kind of stemming toward a political conversation, which could yeah. be divisive. Yeah. How is having, you know, I, I, one of the core values of leaders, I think is love, right? The, mm-hmm. the, the GLE values are faith, love, integrity, and courage. And, and I think it takes a lot of courage to love somebody enough to be brave enough to tell them the truth. And, and it's not about pushing an agenda. It's not about sharing a message. It's about telling the truth. And so, you know, how do you think about and, and what can leaders out there do to help themselves when they're maybe not feeling as courageous as, as they could or, or they're challenged to tell the truth in a tough situation? Like, what, what would you say to the next generation of leaders out there? Say it. <laughs> uh, that's and that's what I've learned. And honestly, when I when I made that post, is I've progressively gotten. I've watched the impact, and um, I was being soft as much as possible because I wanted these grand conversations from the left and the right. And funny enough, the 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 more middle I played, the more politically correct I played, hinting at my suggestions, the less anybody wanted to have a conversation from both sides. And that was the core concept of one of our main shows would be the change called truth will set you free. And just because something is my truth does not make it the truth. I can try to highlight why I feel it's the truth, but it still is, it still is my version of it. And Mm -hmm. the idea behind it is to have an open mind going into this. So why to go to your question of what is my advice I think what we're seeing right now is the people that disagreed with um, with voting the way that voting for one political party, the ones that disagreed and quote unquote lost, were very quiet about their vote. And now they are being much louder, but it's showing that it's almost it's, it's essentially too late unless they want their vote to be heard again for 2022. So ultimately, speak your truth and not be afraid of the repercussions, because in the end, here's, here's, here's what happens. A few people speak out, somebody like me, and we are at risk of losing certain jobs and certain friendships because we are the few that are speaking out despite what we're doing in our different fields and in our different work. And I'll tell you a funny story after this, but if, if more people like me, who everybody that I used to be friends with knew that I was a good guy, knew that I legitimately was always 
giving money to charities, donating time, spending ways of like helping people, investing in my friends of all races. But once I started to speak up, I was deemed as this horrible person. Why? Because the media puts me as this person and because not enough people are speaking up. Now, if we've got tens of thousands of people that are at least speaking their mind on what they do, all of a sudden it doesn't mean that one side of the political coin is strictly a bunch of country bumpkins from the middle of nowhere. It's a bunch of intelligent people also where people might go, I disagree with them but that's okay. Like he's, I'm sure he's a smart guy and he's got whatever instead of being the outcast. So my, my only point is if we all risk at the exact same time on our belief system, we'll have a country where we can agree to disagree again, which is always a phrase that can have a negative connotation or a positive. In this case, yeah. I take it positive because that's part of being an American is to disagree on things and to still be brothers and together and all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. I, I think what you just described to me, Reminds me of uh, some of Jocko Willink's stuff and mm -hmm. just really own it. Like, and I've used this example so many times and it, it may not be the best example, but it's like the most relevant one in my head. Like when Trump in his first presidency, you know, in his presidency, like everyone was getting on him for saying these things. And I, this might have even been when he was running and he just likes he, he didn't like apologize for it. He just kind of owned it. Right. He's like, yeah, I said that, whatever. And I think so, we're so afraid to just kind of own, like just own it. And yeah. like, yeah, just, I'll just face the music. Like, that's what I said. Move on. Like, I'm, I'm not going to apologize for what I said. And like you said, it's kind of a get into that agree to disagree point. If we really feel strongly that it's the truth, then, okay, you know, if we just fundamentally disagree, then we fundamentally disagree, but we can both stand here like gentlemen and, and, and women and talk about it and share, share what we think is true and try to seek out the truth. But, you know, I take an ownership and really owning, and this is like a be the change concept for me. It's, it's you, it's up to you to change, yeah. whether that's you changing your mind or you being the change in the world that you want to see, and so many people sit by and they, they're like waiting for someone else out there to like do it. They're like, oh, somebody needs to do something about that. Like the fact that you see it yeah, means that something in you is getting, is called toward that, is, is being directed toward that. You know, you go be the change. Maybe you're the one that needs to be the one that, that really does something about that. So Be the Change started in 2016 when there was the police shooting in Dallas. That's how I started it. There was a police okay. shooting. I lived, I was a block, I was about a, a little less than a mile away. And I started thinking to myself, this is insane. So this is where our country is, is gone, is we have got an anti-police protest where policemen were protecting those protesting against them. And that's where the police officers got killed. And I started looking at everything at once. And it was like, mm -hmm. I was in this kind of odd matrix. And I'm like, why are we, why, as a country, I think we, we've used this term, I'm an activist and, and forgotten a core root part of the word of acting. So all we do as an activist in this country is create awareness. And one of our t-shirts would be the change is action over awareness. And it's like, we have so much capability. Think about if people took, and especially if you want to take from a financial standpoint, all the money donated to Black Lives Matter as an, it's not an organization, as a company, all the money that went to that, if yours a hundred million dollars that you can actually take and put real actionable programs, if the government actually, not that the government would ever do anything like that, but the government could actually put something together where there's community policing, where people get to meet each other in these like state by state programs. And then at the same time, all these people spending hours and hours and hours a week to actually go donate their time. If they don't have money, donate the time. They clearly have it to March to actually educate inner city youth to actually go in and volunteer their time. And it's like, we have missed the mark so much in the last, I mean, forever in this country, we've had little issues, but we have in the last 10 years, it's like we have completely forgotten what it means to actually be the change and what our issues are, what we have a problem with. I said that the only thing in the last decade, that needed awareness in our country where it's like nobody knew what was going on was the Flint water crisis. Nobody <laughs> knew that was happening. Besides that, everything else, like inner city youth not, ha not having a fair shake, bad education, uh, issues with police <laughs> here and there. We know let's actually do something that actually can make it better instead of just march up streets. And that was kind of the epiphany that I had at that time. That's why be where Be the Change came from. 
That's so funny, man. It, we actually, I was taught, I had a doctor on my show last episode and he just, he brought up the Flint water crisis when oh, we were talking funny. about water. What are the chances? <laughs> but I, I love that, man. I, um, I think like, I don't know about you. Like maybe I've lived a, a sheltered life or, or something, but half the stuff I hear in the mainstream, I can't even relate to it. Like, I don't even understand it. And in the world that I see living where I live, and, and going, you know, I've lived in downtown Detroit, Michigan. I've lived in, you know, wealthy counties in Michigan. I've lived in Chicago. I've lived in Texas in multiple places. Like I don't see any of the stuff, you know, I know people of all races, religions, whatever, all this, all this conflict and stuff going on. Like I don't, I don't see it. And so when I hear these things, this narrative, these things being being pushed by the the magic box that tells us what to think. It makes me think everybody needs to turn that thing off because if they just went and turned it off, they would start thinking for themselves again and be able to see when they turn it back on how much of a joke, it's literally a joke. It's a, it's a, it's a play. You're watching a movie. Like there's, there's nothing real on there. There's nothing on there except what they want you to be thinking about. So, you know, it's called TV programming for a reason. And, and I really think, up to, you know, to your point, if people really want the truth and want to get back to the truth and really, you know, be activists and be able to act and make a difference toward the causes that really matter, you know, th- they're in their communities. They're right where they're sitting. Right they're right in their, in their area where they can go take action. And it's really cool that guys like you are doing that. So t- talk more about Be The Change. Give us a little overview of what all you're doing. Yeah. And um, let our audience know where they can find you. Yeah, so we had uh, King Randall uh, was on last week. We have so in Be the Change, we've got a whole bunch of different shows, and it grew leaps and bounds. We had all you know five hundred followers before COVID started, and the next thing you know, um, we I started talking a little bit about that. I had some entertaining shows with like movies and giving away trivia and helping people during COVID, like giving five dollar things, and people were paying it forward. It was great. And then did Truth Will Set You Free, George Floyd happened. I ended up becoming friends. Uh, I, I instant messaged a guy and he responded back. Uh, his name was Cashley Kelly, went super viral. He was a black dude that talked about when are Black Lives Matter can yeah. matter to black people. And he, um, he was an ex-Latin King gang member. And him and I became best of friends. I'm his godfather to his new daughter. Like we, we got, we got close really, really fast And it. And all of the, the things that we started doing on our shows were interesting because it was, I was typically one of the only white people and, (laughs) and we were having trouble getting both sides to come in and have a conversation because we didn't have experts on race, race theory. Uh, Our audience was too white, even though all of our hosts were, were multiracial. Like, it's like, what is happening? But we continue to press on and we have a show called change makers. That's why I brought it. King Randall. King Randall is our last guest. We've had Daryl Davis. King Randall just kind of got big. You've seen him on Fox news uh, about to be on CNN. He was on Kelly, Kelly Clarkson shows today. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's or well, whenever this airs weeks ago, whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so we, we bring on people that are creating change to show change is possible. We also have events. Um, we've got an event that I think might be happening right around when this comes out that um, is called Operation Take Back America, which is just educating people how to utilize their vote. Uh, And it is a conservative event, but it's just, it's utilizing kind of logic and people are wondering what their rights are as people. What if, you know, what if they lose their job? We've got lawyers coming in, we've got politicians that are going to speak. And we are just essentially, I made, I made the commitment about, uh, about three months ago to say, I don't know how to hide the fact that be the change is mine. And I have conservative beliefs that I hope that can create positive change in this world. So I went down that rabbit hole and that's a, uh, that's kind of where it's been. And we do have a lot of political stuff and we have conversations that go back and forth uh, between all, between all aspects. And uh, that's pretty much to just be the change. And you can find it at uh, Facebook, be the change USA, YouTube, which I have six more days of my first ever jail sentence on YouTube uh, made it, I guess, a bad comment about masks. Hey man, you're going to have to get on bit shoot and all these other platforms. Eh? <sighs> I know I need, I need to, I think I need more people to help me post stuff up, but we've got, we, we have great groups. We work with primetime Patriots is our news wing. American snippets is a, is a veteran 
kind of run concepts there with us. And then we talk about the change based stuff and have the hard conversations uh, on our shows as well. So that's kind of where we are. So be the change USA is the easiest way to find us hashtag spelled out, be the change USA.com or my personal speaking on double down strategy.com. Super cool. Anthony pleasure having you on, man. And I think it's important too, because lots of people try to steer clear of political conversations these days. And the old adage I think is right on, you know, the three most important topics that we need to talk about are religion, sex, and politics. And they're so faux pas in what we talk about, but they are ingrained in the fabric of everything they do. And they touch all the lives of everyone in our society. So they're important things. We should talk about them with love and respect for each other. And it's cool that you're doing that, Anthony, and taking action and being the change in your community. So thanks for coming on GLE, man. It's been a pleasure. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Phil, thank you so much. It was my pleasure.